Welcome to our deep dive uh, into the world of lasers. Yes. You've provided a fascinating mix of sources, including excerpts from a recent Italian physics journal article on laser history and development. Yeah, that's right. Our goal today is to uncover the key milestones in laser history, understand the basic physics behind these incredible devices, yeah. and explore some of the most exciting advancements, all the way from the first ruby laser to the mind-blowing Addo second lasers used to study electron movement. Absolutely. It's uh, it's going to be quite a journey. Yeah, it really is. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing to think about, you know, we talk about lasers and we see lasers all the time now right. in everyday life. But uh, to think about just how far this technology has come, yeah. it's incredible. It truly is a remarkable journey. And you might be surprised to learn that the foundation for lasers goes back over a century to 1916 with none other than Albert Einstein. Einstein. You're telling me the guy behind relativity also had a hand in laser technology. He did indeed. Well, he's most famous for relativity. His work on the quantum theory of radiation is actually what laid the groundwork for lasers. He introduced a concept called stimulated emission, which is absolutely crucial to how lasers work. What's fascinating, though, is that even Einstein didn't fully grasp the practical potential of this discovery. So it was like a seed waiting for the right conditions to sprout. Exactly. Who picked up where Einstein left off? Well, a Russian physicist named Valentin Fabricant was one of the first to really explore the possibilities of stimulated emission. In the late 1930s and early 40s, he achieved something called population inversion in a gas, which is essential for light amplification. Think of it like this, for a laser to work. You need more atoms in an excited high energy state than in a low energy state. Okay. Fabricant figured out how to get those atoms all pumped up and ready to release energy as light. So he essentially primed the atoms to release a burst of energy like a crowd ready to erupt in cheers. A perfect analogy. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, his work was classified by the Russian government until 1958, which meant others had to independently rediscover some of his findings. That's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So while his work was hidden, research continued elsewhere. Absolutely. Two other Russians, Basov and Prokhorov, were also exploring stimulated emission. And there was actually a bit of a scientific race going on with an American physicist, Charles Townes, and his team at Columbia University. A scientific race. <laughs> Always makes for a good story. It does. What were they racing towards? Building upon the groundwork laid by those before them, Townes and his team successfully built the first Maser in 1954. A Maser is very similar to a laser. But instead of amplifying visible light, it amplifies microwaves. Ah, so they were getting closer to the laser, but not quite there yet. What happened next? Well, things got a bit complicated. There was some debate about what to even call this new device an optical maser or a laser. Yeah. Another scientist, Gordon Gould, had actually coined the term laser back in 1957, and he ended up fighting a long battle for recognition and patent rights. So it was like a lot of drama surrounded the birth of the laser? There was quite a bit. So who ultimately created the first working laser? That credit goes to Theodore Maiman. In 1960, he constructed the first functioning laser, a ruby laser that emitted pulses of red light. Wow. The setup was surprisingly simple. A ruby rod surrounded by a helical flash lamp, all encased in a silver-coated cylinder. So this invention that we find in everything from barcode scanners to those laser pointers you could pick up for a few dollars, yeah. it all started with a ruby rod and a flash lamp. It might sound simple in retrospect, yeah. but it was a revolutionary breakthrough. To fully grasp the impact of Maimon's invention, we need to take a quick detour into the basic physics behind lasers. It's this understanding that allows us to truly appreciate how they work and why they're so versatile. I'm excited to dive into that. Yeah. But we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Okay, so let's break down the three key components that make a laser work. It all starts with the active medium. This is the material which could be a gas, liquid, or solid that actually amplifies the light. So the active medium is like the heart of the laser, what? what gives it the energy to do its thing. That would be the second component, the pumping system. This is what provides energy to the atoms in the active medium, creating that all-important population inversion we talked about with Fabricant's work. It's all about getting those atoms excited and ready to release energy as light. Right. We need those energized atoms. So what happens to all that light energy? That's where the third piece comes in the optical resonator. Usually this is a pair of mirrors that reflect the light back and forth through the active medium. With every pass between these mirrors, the light gets amplified like a snowball, gathering more and more snow as it rolls downhill. So the resonator keeps the light contained, allowing it to build up energy and intensity. And this whole process, if I'm understanding correctly, is what creates the unique properties of laser light 
monochromaticity and coherence. Exactly. Monochromaticity means that laser light is essentially a single pure color or wavelength. It's very different from the light from a light bulb, which is a messy mix of many colors. That makes sense. So laser light is pure color. What about this coherence thing? It sounds complicated. It's actually a pretty straightforward concept. Imagine a marching band where everyone is perfectly in step. That's coherence. All the light waves in a laser beam are traveling together in sync, unlike the jumbled waves from a regular light source. And this coherence is what gives lasers their incredible precision and focus. Okay, so we've got our super organized single color beam of light. Now I'm dying to know, how did we go from Mayman's Ruby laser in 1960 to lasers that can send video signals millions of miles? You mentioned NASA's Psyche mission earlier, using lasers to communicate across vast distances. That's a great example of how far laser technology has advanced. The Psyche mission shattered data transmission records, sending video from 31 million kilometers away using a powerful system that includes an erbium iterbium laser on the spacecraft and a ground-based nd bot yag laser for the uplink. nd by ag I feel like I've heard that somewhere before. Is that a common type of laser? It is. nd by ag lasers are workhorses in many fields, from medicine to manufacturing. But the Psyche mission is just one snapshot of the remarkable evolution of lasers since that first Ruby laser. Okay, walk us through it. What were some of the other major milestones? The 1960s were a period of rapid development. We saw the emergence of helium neon lasers, those iconic red lasers often used in classrooms. Semiconductor lasers, which are incredibly compact, also appeared, though early versions needed to be cooled. So even in those early days, they were already working on shrinking down the size of lasers. Absolutely. Size and efficiency have always been key areas of focus. Another major innovation in the 60s was the development of Q-switching, a technique for generating very powerful laser pulses. I remember you mentioned Q switching earlier. How does that work exactly? It's all about controlling the release of energy. Imagine holding back a dam and then suddenly letting loose a torrent of water. That's essentially what Q switching does with light. It allows you to build up a lot of energy inside the laser and then release it in a very short burst, creating incredibly powerful pulses. Fascinating. So the 60s were clearly a pivotal decade for lasers. What happened next? The innovations kept coming. The 1970s saw the arrival of room temperature semiconductor lasers. This was a huge step because it eliminated the need for those bulky cooling systems, paving the way for miniaturizing lasers. This is the technology that eventually led to the tiny lasers found in our smartphones and other devices today. It's amazing to think that something as ubiquitous as a smartphone relies on this technology that has such a complex history. It really is. We also saw the emergence of other laser types in the 70s, including chemical lasers, excimer lasers, and the concept of quantum well lasers, which led to even more compact and efficient devices down the road. It sounds like laser research was really exploding during this period. Did this rapid development continue into the 80s? Absolutely. The 80s ushered in even more groundbreaking advancements. Titanium sapphire lasers, known for their ability to generate incredibly short pulses, emerged on the scene. Erbium-doped fiber amplifiers, which we already touched on with the Psyche mission revolutionized long-distance optical communication, and free electron lasers capable of generating some of the most powerful beams were developed for a wide range of scientific and industrial uses. It's mind-boggling to consider all the different types of lasers and their applications. I'm guessing the 90s and 2000s brought even more breakthroughs. You bet. The 90s saw the development of quantum cascade lasers, which emit light in the mid to far infrared range, opening up exciting possibilities in sensing and spectroscopy. We also saw the first atomic laser, which used a Bose-Einstein condensate an incredibly exotic state of matter as its active medium. And then there were random lasers, which unlike traditional lasers, don't even need an optical cavity. A laser without a cavity. That sounds almost counterintuitive. It seems like every decade brought a whole new set of innovations. Mm. Exactly. The advancements just kept coming. GAN-N lasers, which emit blue-violet light, became essential for high-density data storage. And ultra-fast lasers, capable of producing pulses down to the femtosecond regime, allowed scientists to study incredibly fast processes like chemical reactions in real time. We've gone from millisecond pulses to femtosecond pulses in just a few decades. Yeah. That's an incredible leap. So where do we go from here? What does the future hold for lasers? So much to look forward to, it seems like. But, you know, going back to what we were just talking about with these ultra-fast lasers, right. it's incredible to think how far laser technology has come in just a few decades. Yeah. From those early ruby lasers to the mind-boggling world of femtosecond pulses and beyond. It is amazing. What are some of the most exciting areas where lasers are pushing the boundaries of science today? 
Well, two areas really stand out, I think, uh, attosecond lasers and their role in nuclear fusion research. You mentioned attosecond lasers earlier. I did. Can you remind me what makes them so special? Imagine pulses of light so short they're measured in attoseconds. That's one quintillionth of a second. Oh. These lasers allow us to study the movement of electrons, Yeah. the fundamental building blocks of matter, right. in real time. It's like having the ultimate high-speed camera wow. for the microscopic world. So we can actually see electrons in motion. Well, not with our eyes directly, but with sophisticated detectors that can capture these incredibly fleeting events. Attosecond lasers are opening up a whole new realm of possibilities for understanding the fundamental nature of matter. It's mind-blowing to consider the implications of that kind of research. Yeah. What about nuclear fusion? I know it's been a long-standing goal to harness fusion as a clean energy source, and I understand lasers play a key role in that quest. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Nuclear fusion, the process that powers the sun, has the potential to provide us with a virtually limitless supply of clean energy. Yeah. And high-powered lasers are crucial for achieving fusion here on Earth through a process called inertial confinement fusion. So how does inertial confinement fusion actually work? In simple terms, powerful laser beams are focused onto a tiny target containing hydrogen isotopes. This intense energy compresses and heats the target to extreme temperatures and pressures, similar to those found at the core of the sun, triggering fusion reactions. It sounds like we're essentially creating miniature suns in the lab. You could say that. One of the most impressive facilities for this type of research is the National Ignition Facility, or NIF, in the United States. It houses 192 incredibly powerful laser beams, all converging on a target about the size of a peppercorn. I've heard of NIF. It's a truly massive laser system. Have they made any progress towards achieving fusion energy? They have. A few years ago, NIF achieved a major breakthrough, reaching what's called scientific break-even. Okay. For the first time, they produced more energy from fusion reactions than the laser energy delivered to the target. Wow, that's a significant milestone. Does this mean fusion power is just around the corner? It's certainly a major step forward, but there are still many challenges to overcome before fusion becomes a practical source of energy. However, the progress at NIF and other facilities around the world gives us hope that fusion power could one day become a reality. Looking back at the journey of lasers, it's incredible to see how they've evolved from a theoretical concept to a technology that's transforming our world in countless ways. It truly is remarkable. It is a testament to human ingenuity and the power of scientific exploration. And we've only scratched the surface of what lasers can do. I think that's right. We've covered a lot of ground in this deep dive, from the fundamental principles of lasers to their remarkable evolution over the past six decades. It's clear that lasers have revolutionized our world, and their impact will only continue to grow, especially in those cutting-edge fields we discussed, like attosecond physics and nuclear fusion. The development of attosecond lasers has given us unprecedented insight into the ultra-fast world of electrons. What will the next generation of lasers reveal about the universe and the very building blocks of reality? That's something to think about. It is indeed. This has been another deep dive. Thanks for listening.